This is a University of Otago podcast. I'm thinking that none of you um, are likely to want to be ophthalmologists. So I'm not going to give you a commercial for what we do. I'm going to tell you what we've done wrong. So um, this is the, uh, just a background. We have a, a postgraduate diploma in ophthalmic basic sciences. Um, and we've taught it for 15 years. Uh, averaging about six to eight students a year, so it's not one of the high flyers in terms of enrollments. Um, the aim is to provide ophthalmic basic sciences to people who want to be ophthalmologists. They're not ophthalmologists. They've recently graduated as medical students. They're now doctors. They're in the process of becoming more qualified as doctors by doing a house surgeon uh, role for two years, and we try to catch them in that time uh, and if they're wanting to look at ophthalmology as a career, then we provide them with the basic sciences that, that they will ultimately require. Um, the aim, apart from the, the uh, teaching the aspiring trainees, was to make the information available equitably and um, also to eliminate geographic disadvantage. And nowhere is more geographically disadvantaged than Dunedin. Uh, and also encourage interactivity so that the students got to uh, interact with their, with their colleagues. Um, in 2001, when we'd been running for a year, we were approached by Sydney, uh, who had been considering offering a similar course. These guys are all wanting to become trainees of the Royal Australia New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists. They opt out of the university system straight away as soon as they've graduated and they join the college system, which is a great deal tougher than the university system uh, and a great deal more constrained. Um, our aim was to get them to the point where they could hit the road running um, when they became, when they got on the training scheme. Um, sim similarly, Sydney had the same sort of thoughts. They wanted to do something for their graduates of a similar nature and we struck an arrangement whereby we said, look, this is all distance taught. There's no reason why we can't teach it jointly. Nobody's going to know where the, tu the actual tuitions come from. Um, so let's do it together. And that's what we did. In 2002, we signed a, a memorandum of understanding, uh, which I drafted. <laughs> and then Sydney's lawyers got hold of it. And I think one sentence out of my original M -O -A MOU, rather, um, was, was, was used in the final draft. I think they, they used one of my sentences. But anyway, we signed it and we're all happy and it's worked very well since. We, we share the teaching and the assessment proportionately. They have about 30 to 40 students to our six to eight, so they do by far the bulk of the teaching and the assessment, which suits me down to the ground. We also share the prax. We run a, a three-week practicum. We do ours in June, they do theirs in, in December, and students can choose whichever venue they, they wish to go to. And uh, that shares a load of that rather nicely as well. Uh, they're all medically qualified. They're at least two years postgraduate. They, the, the eligibility is that they should be able to be registered. That's all we ask within the country. And of course, the vast majority of candidates don't live in Dunedin. Although, curiously, we had a Saudi student literally knock on our door about seven years ago saying he wanted to do it. And we said, well, it's distance taught. And well, here I am, he said, you know. So he stayed in Dunedin and did the distance course as a, as a resident. Uh, that, that actually challenged a lot of people. They made him do another, another paper in order to be eligible. Because it was a distance paper, he had to do a paper in genetics, which wasn't distance taught, in order to stay here as a student. Curious a little uh, quirk of the enrollment system there. Um, there are five 800 level papers, so in theory they can do uh, four papers without doing the practicum, but very seldom that happens. The vast majority opt to, opt to do the practicum. Uh, four of them are 13 week lecture programs, and they're obviously provided within a semester. Um, four papers are taught on the distance learning platform, but the prac, as I mentioned before, is, is residential. We offer all papers in every semester, and it's just a matter of pushing a button and letting the stuff roll out. There's no involvement of the staff other than marking and, and uh, being on call if, if required to answer questions. The assessments consist of three 3,000 word assignments per semester, 
and uh, a final written exam at the end of each semester, which was three hours in duration. So quite heavy on the, assi on the assessment side of things. So this is what I'm really here to talk about, is what, what did we get wrong? Well, we started off trying to synchronous teach everything. Uh, we, we'd give them the information, we'd put it out there, and we'd say, right, at the end of each week, the person who's responsible for giving these lectures will be available between these hours. You can come and talk to them. Well, I think if we got three students in the first semester, we'd have been lucky. Very, very poor uptake. They weren't interested. The, the reasons are, of course, the geographic distribution is huge. Um, some of our students were from Western Australia, so there's a six-hour time difference to start with. And they, they just didn't want it. They just didn't need it. They were quite happy to just learn the stuff. It was very well prepared in the main. Not all of it. We've refined it since. But the synchronous stuff just wasn't working. So now we've re really confined our synchronous teaching to that one uh, session at the very beginning where everybody gets together and says hello. And half the time it doesn't work because some of them can't get online or what have you. So that's it for synchronous teaching. Um, and I think that pretty much is borne out by the research. Um, it, 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 they're really saying that face-to-face -face is good, but it doesn't necessarily make any difference to what they get. And um, we get, if you want to, if you, I put this in because I thought, well, if you're not, if you're not getting very good teaching evaluations, you might want to consider this as, 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 a, <laughs> as an option. Um, the, they're a lot more costly to run and, and technologically really difficult to get going. I know Zoom has made a huge difference, but I mean, you have to consider, do you need the talking head? You know, because that's using up a lot of bandwidth as well. Um, but in terms of a, of a, a mode of delivery, I think synchronous is, is it's not suitable for what we do anyway. Um, th this is actually quite interesting. I think it's actually correct. We have a very, very rich um, content in our material that we deliver and they just need a lot of time to absorb it, and it doesn't necessarily coincide with the, the synchronous uh, environment. So the, the take-home message from that is, well, you know, if you're doing a, a 800-level paper, sort of the amount of information we've got, probably better to avoid synchronous teaching altogether, which is what we found, and um, use a variety of techniques. The assignments were too long. Three 3,000 assignments was just more than they could handle, given that they had all this work to do as well. And they're all working full time. So this is a really tough, tough ask. But having said that, the quality of the assignments was fantastic, and still is. We've cut it down to two assignments. We, they still get the 3,000 word criteria, but the, um, the third assignment now, we, we don't give them a topic. We give them a previous assignment and ask them to criticize it. And that goes down very well because they learn a lot from doing that. In fact, at one point, we, we gave them two assignments, one of which had been, they both been marked, obviously, one of which had been marked very highly and the other had been marked as a fail. And we asked them to mark them. And we did this for a while, but it wasn't as successful as giving them a good assignment and asking them, or a you know, goodish assignment, ask them to criticize it. But curiously, one of the ones that had failed, a student picked up plagiarism that we'd missed. And turned it in had missed it as well. So that was a bit of a worry. Yeah, it was a really obvious bit of plagiarism. We hadn't seen it. And, or the marker had. Fortunately, it wasn't one of us that I'd buy. So I felt quite good about that. But um, yeah, it was a curious anomaly. And turn it in, you'd have thought, we, you know, we, most of us rely on turn it in for assignments. Missed it, completely missed it. Um, so we've, we've changed it. We use a lot more forums and a lot more wikis than we used to use. Um, we, uh, we encourage them to participate in the forum. In fact, we've actually made the forum part of their assignment, part of their overall mark. They can now get up to 10% for their contributions on the forum. And it really does work. Um, they, they, I, I should have, having seen other people putting their, their um, forums down as, you know, the number of of um, hits, as it were, ours are in the hundreds. We, we get loads of hits on our forum. They're, they're very, very keen on this, pro this approach, and they really do engage with it. Um, but they don't like being marked for it. I'll, I'll come back to that shortly. Um, well, there it is there, 10%. Uh, 
uh, the way we, we work it is 5% for quality, 5% for quantity. So the number of hits you make, the number of, of, of uh, contributions you make, rather, uh, counts for 5%, or up to 5%, and the quality of your contribution counts for up to 5 as well. So that's, um, that's quite a fair way of doing it. Um, we, we ran into problems because we've got too much stuff. We, we're archiving our forums so they can see what the previous year's students have, have contributed. And then because that got so heavily congested, we started to wiki it. So we put them under topics now so they can actually look at a topic and see the, the previous forum contributions. But even that's getting somewhat, uh, I don't want to use the term constipated, but it's, it's certainly getting a bit crowded. Um, now, it's a very good way of encouraging collaborative knowledge. And, and they're, they're, I mean, these, these people are usually extremely literate and extremely, uh, uh, <laughs> well, hard to shut up would be a good way to describe it, um, <laughs> vocal. Um, but the, the fact that they're actually participating is, is definitely improving their learning and definitely improving their, uh, their knowledge. Um, we had a guy do a master of medical education and he looked at um, our forums and our wikis and uh, this is what he came up with. So he, he, he was quite impressed with the number of, well, very impressed with the amount of engagement of the students. We use Ocean Browser, by the way. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Ocean Browser. We, we started off with Blackboard and uh, Sydney, when they joined us, were using WebCT. And of course, those two have since amalgamated. But at the time, we had this sort of difference of you know, this isn't going to work because we're both using different LMSs. And we finished up both using Ocean Browser, uh, which we've never gone off. It's been so good. And so it's now up to OB3. It's been so successful. Um, that we've, and it, you can integrate it within Blackboard. You can run it under Blackboard and, and still use it. But it does handle the large files really well, the big, the big sort of RLOs and the uh, three-dimensional stuff that, that you normally struggle with. I mean, some of the feedback we got was things like, you know, I'd, I'd go to download my um, uh, assignment or whatever for this week, and my, my readings for this week, and then I'd go and put the T on. And by the time I got back, it might have downloaded. You know, that's, that's no good. You can't work like that. So that's when we switched to Ocean Browser. Um, there's a little a bit of resentment, and it's curious that the literature supports this. Some of them feel that uh, they're not actually making much of a contribution because it's already been done. Somebody else has done it before them. So uh, that's, that's been a bit of a problem. Um, so I think we ended up deciding we really have kept too much of the previous material. And we haven't solved this problem yet, but we're going to have to look at it very, very hard. We're probably going to have to cull some of it. Or maybe we'll just keep it for three years or four years or something along that, that line because the, the, as you build it up, eventually you reach a point where there's nothing more that anybody can add, and they get a bit um, frustrated by that. And I don't blame them. Um, but at the same time, you don't want them asking the same questions that you know everybody else has asked when there's an obvious answer to it. So, you know, being a bit lazy, it's nice just to leave it there so that they can see what everybody's asked. But it's like frequently asked questions, you know, it's the same sort of approach. Um, but wicking it may have, may have solved some of that, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, here's some of the uh, comments that the students, oh no, sorry, this is the evidence, right? Um, so the, basically they were showing, uh, if you too, put too much content in, too much accumulated content, it will actually uh, detract from your course. So uh, that's a salutary lesson there for us. Um, the obvious, I mean, we're trying to make it self-directed, and it is self-directed too, but you've got to keep in mind that these guys are used to self-directed learning, so it's not a big deal for them to, to, to get into this sort of style of education. And uh, as I say, half of them were very much in favor of what we were doing, and half of them were opposed to it. So um, it's it's hard to actually get the balance right, and I think we probably have got it about right, where we've got the the effect that uh, half of them don't like it and half of them do. So I don't think you can do much better than that. Um, here are some of the comments that they made. Um, 
And that, that's, that's useful. You know, you, you hear that, you think, well, actually, we're doing the right thing. People are getting some value from this. But then you get this sort of comment that, um, you know, they're not, they're cheating. They're, they're cutting and pasting. They're not, they're not actually doing it themselves. They're just cutting and pasting and popping it in. Well, you know, I, I sympathize with them, but on the other hand, most of what we do is cutting and pasting in one form or another. You might change the wording a bit just to avoid uh, being caught plagiarizing, but effectively you, you're cutting and pasting from somebody else's work. Um, you're not reinventing the wheel each time. So, yeah, I'm still a bit torn on that one. See this sort of comment here. Um, another comment of the same sort of nature um, really doesn't like it. Well, it's probably a good comment, but I'm not sure how you get around it. Um, and then you get some lovely things, you know. That's gold, mate. Well done, and thanks for sharing. Um, I love working with computers. So I like the style of learning. You know, so you, you do feel as though you're, you're getting it right, but um, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I just feel as, it's interesting to hear these views. And this all came out of this guy's um, Master of Medical Education study. He was doing a qualitative study, which was almost unknown in medicine, but anyway, there he was doing it. And uh, I'm pleased he did. And, Gave us some good insights. So, in conclusion, we um, oh, he, this is his conclusion, or not mine. Um, there are sufficient, significant individual differences, which is, I mean, we all knew this anyway. Every, anybody who teaches knows that, that every student's got a slightly different approach to learning, um, and so you have to cater for that. When you're building building your course, you have to make sure that you're actually dealing with all the different types of learning, and hopefully providing that for them. So, keeping on going. We didn't have enough RLOs. Now, is, is it right, Alison, you make the RLOs? I was delighted to hear that. I couldn't believe it. So you make them. Well, I'll come to see you. Um, we didn't have enough. We, we definitely want more. Um, we, we beg, beat, and borrow, and steal RLOs. Um, we've got all sorts of people making them. The best people from our point of view, and I don't want to contradict what you've done. I think it's been fantastic. Uh, um, computer geeks, you know, you find somebody who's really went into computers and somebody described them as a bit like a flea without a dog. Um, they love, you know, you give them a project to do and they just love it and you get some fantastic RLOs as a result. Um, and uh, we, we've got animation research who've made our RLOs in 3D. They're just amazing. They're absolutely, truly amazing. But we still don't have enough of them. We just keep churning them out. They're very, very expensive and very time consuming. So I'll be knocking on your door. Um, so this, this is all part of the appropriate use of the medium. Um, obviously, web-based interface allows presentation of high quality images, movies, interactive labels and diagrams. And this is what basically RLOs uh, and, and enable us to do. Um, some of the anatomy um, Specimens are really fragile and really precious, and if we can make 3D models of them, that's, that's fantastic. 3D images of them, because it's the next best thing to actually physically handling them. So again, it's a really good use of the, of the medium, and uh, of course, as I mentioned before, RLOs, um, which are a sort of extension of, of that, are the ideal method. Uh, and this, I think this is absolutely right. I think if you've got a good curriculum and a bank of RLOs, that's probably all you need. Um, there's enough information, from our point of view anyway, in that for everything that we require. So where will we be in 10 years' time? This is my favorite, but I always like doing strategic thinking and where it's, where's it going to go in 10 years? Well, first of all, we can actually verify that it's the student's work with keystroke log monitoring. So we're definitely going to be able to ensure, ensure that we're not being uh, cheated or, or the system isn't being rorted by people doing um, other people's work for them, which is going on a great deal, as we all know, in, in other contexts. And of course, if they're distance learning, you just don't know who's doing it. Well, with, with the keystroke log monitoring, that's all going to change. 
Um, we've got a completely different generation of undergraduates. They've never known a world without Wikipedia or Google. And a generation where at primary and secondary school, they've always had laptops and used them to access information. We all know this anyway. It's just changing the way people learn. It's changing the way they gain their information. And of course, as they get into postgraduate education, this is what they're demanding. And the question is, are we adapting to our students? As well, or are we forcing our students to adapt to us? And I think that's not a bad question. Um, I think the curriculum's got to be organic. It's got to respond. It's got to react to any changes that are emerging. And of course, uh, ophthalmology is very much a changing game. There's, uh, not only surgery, but also drugs are changing everything. Uh, you've, only, you've heard just recently in the paper this new drug that's preventing people from going blind is having a huge effect on clinics. The clinics are just getting completely clogged up with it. In the past, we just said to them, sorry, we can't do anything for you. Off you go. Now we can say, yes, come back. In three months' time, come back again. We'll do another injection, and, and it's making an enormous difference. Well, it, this has got to be built into the curriculum. You can't ignore that sort of change. Um, people are obviously using what we call micro learning environments. They're, they're using more smartphones and tablets, and they're sitting on the bus looking up articles or between meetings, etc. And this is changing the way they're learning. We've got to cater for that. Our, our information has got to be made available in that form. Again, synchronous versus asynchronous. I think most all material will be delivered asynchronously. The ability to communicate and collaborate will become a seamless part of any course, synchronously or asynchronously. And the act of teaching will become one, more of one having great pedagogical, pedagogical knowledge. Sorry about that. Is that, is that right? Pedagogical, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's a horrible word, isn't it? I don't know where it came from. <laughs> I know how best to teach the topic rather than just knowing about the topic. This is, this is the key to it. You know, you can be the font of all knowledge and not be able to put it across. And it's hopeless. And obviously, in understanding, managing, collaboration to ensure effective learning. Pitching to the converted here. Um, we're going to use a, a variety of de delivery platforms and equipment, smartphones, tablets, e-books. We try to get an e-book sponsored. We tried to get one of the drug companies to sponsor an e-book so they could put their logo on the front and um, have all the content within the ebook, um, which is perfectly feasible. Ebook, the, the, you know, Kindles can hold all of the content, the stuff that we deliver. Um, we were a bit quick. It was about ten years ago. I think if we tried it today, we'd probably be a bit more successful. Um, TED style lectures, you know, why give a talk on something which there's a world authority on somewhere else who's done it somewhere else, and and you know, why repl replicate their talk? Why not give the student the link and say, look. This guy is much more knowledgeable than I am. When you've heard his or her lecture, come back to me and I'll ask her some of your questions. What's wrong with that? I mean, these are the best people in the world. I can't possibly hope to compete with them. So I think that's the way we're going to go. Interrogatable databases. You know, the whole of medicine could be contained within one database. You just ask the question and the machine will answer it. If the thing can play Jeopardy, which it could in this case, the Watson computer, it can certainly be interrogatable as far as um, teaching medicine is concerned. So I'm sure that's going to happen. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm still uh, not sure about this, but I've put it in there. A collection of archived forum entries or wikis from both pre staff and previous students um, could, could well be a useful thing in the future. Um, learning analytics, we can see where the students have been, we can see where they've waited the longest, where they've looked more closely, etc., etc., what they've skipped through, and that's going to help us, that's going to inform our teaching in the future. So it's going to get more and more automated. Ocean Browser does it, has a very good um, service for that. It can tell us, you know, how long they spent on a particular topic and how much uh, time they took before they moved on. So it's a, it, it's, it's a useful tool. Um, we're going to have to modify the courses to suit the students' attributes. We do anyway. We do it intuitively. But we've got to be sort of more uh, involved in that process. And um, obviously, whatever the students leave behind is, should be recognized as an additional rich source of data and analyzed as such. 
3D hardware and software, um, 3D printers, you know, again, using anatomy is a good example. There are anatomical specimens which are just so fragile that they can't be handled. But we could easily set it up and have them print them out themselves, or even just an ordinary 3D uh, print out of a, of a bone or something like that. They could type it in and out would come a plastic facsimile in their own home. It hasn't happened yet, but it won't be long till it does. Uh, 3D um, videos and stuff uh, already around. It's, it's, it's definitely in use, and we use it. Uh, assessments will all be done online, um, maybe using video conferencing. Um, and we've got virtual surgery coming in now, which is going to change things considerably once we can afford the equipment. It's very, very expensive. Um, and you can then obviously assess them in the normal way if you wish afterwards and keystroke dynamics I've already talked about. Uh, so there we are in summary, better methods of access and better devices, TED type lectures, Watson type interactive software, 3D software, learning analytics to use, used to modify courses and keystroke recognition. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So there's those sorts of difficulties. We, we jointly administer, so we, we have an administrator here, and they have two in Australia, and they talk to each other the whole time. We run joint strategic planning sessions. We've got one coming up in, in March of next year, and uh, we just nut out any problems. And we have combined prizes. That's another thing. I didn't mention that, but we have a prize for each of the three papers that we, there's mainly three, there's, there are four, but the fourth one's seldom used. Each of the three papers has a prize associated with it, and at the end of every year we decide which of the, between the both universities, which is the top student, and we give the prize accordingly. And I'm happy to say New Zealanders are winning prizes more proportionately than the Australians are, which is nice. But you've, no. The uh, agreement that you have with the University of Sydney might be of interest to many of us, I think, just in terms of, um, you know, one of the barriers is, is trying to get sort of institutional Correct. Yeah. Uh, parameters in yeah. place at such yeah. an agreement. So, I mean, I don't know if that could be made available, but that well, would be we, we, very helpful for us. Indeed. I, I mean, I've, we've got a copy of ours. Obviously, it's fairly specific, but some of it would be, would be generic. Um, but remember, I wrote it. I, I wanted it written by our lawyers, and... and you know, never did get written by our lawyers. So I wrote it and then took it across to Sydney and said, sign here, and they said, oh, hang on a minute. And it, and, it, and it went to their lawyers. Now, they really did get stuck in. I mean, they really were very, very good. But they didn't, ch I mean, they changed the wording. They made it more legalistic. They didn't really change the essence of it. And, and, and they added a lot of stuff that I'd forgotten to put in, which was fine. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I was disappointed that we didn't have a better... Uh, sort of arrangement from the, from the get-go, yeah. You did have a long, hard battle with that, didn't you? Oh, d yeah. I could so, be here all day telling you about the yeah. difficulties of administration, yeah. Now it's, it's, it's been in place for a while. Do yeah. you have ongoing issues with that? Well, with, we, we that pretty much sort them out because there's a lovely clause in there which says, you know, within limits you can just deal with this at your own discretion. It's really covering the big picture, you know, and the sort of thing is the students at risk and that sort of stuff. How do you deal with that? Yeah. But basically, the university's happy and it doesn't... Well, I wouldn't say happy. So no, OK, probably, OK, all right. But, but not complaining is probably no. a better way to put it, yeah. Um, I just wanted to make a passing comment about um, whether you're delivering it from scratch, because years ago I was involved in the Open Polytechnic doing a collaboration with the University of Southern Queensland Yes. to do a joint badge degree in engineering and the hoops we went through for two or three years was, was with NZQA. Oh, okay. um, I mean, we couldn't just do an MOU. The whole weight yeah. of NZQA accreditation yeah. had to be worked through and that's if you're developing a joint thing from scratch. Yeah. It was um, certainly not anything to do with gentlemen's agreements. It was pushed yeah. by yeah. NZQA me. who yeah. had their hands over everything. Yeah. So. Um, so is yours badge to Otago or the University of Sydney, depending on which modules they've done, or is it a joint badged piece of paper they if get? If you enrol in, in, a, in New Zealand, yeah. you get an Otago degree. Yeah. If you enrol in Sydney, you get a Sydney degree. Okay. We wanted them joint badged. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't yes, matter. that's where we ran into happen. the problem with a joint badge. It was badging. a real shame. Yeah. Ideally, we'd like the college yeah. badge on there as well, but the colleges didn't want a bar of it. That's why I mentioned to Gary about the college tensions. Colleges just do not want to know. It's, it's as silly as this. I don't want to go on too much about colleges because I absolutely despise them. But anyway, um, <laughs> they sit three subjects, anatomy, physiology, and optics. As soon as they get on the training scheme, the college makes them sit them all over again. They won't even give them recognition for prior learning. Now, they've given, the college gives them 18 months to do this. The people who have graduated from our course, and it's about 70% of all the registrars have done our course, We'll do them in six months, just like that. And they really resent it because it's at a lower level than, than our level and it's stuff they've already done and it means going back to the books, it means taking them off, you know, work time to, to, to where they'd be learning the clinical stuff to do this rubbish all over again. It's not good. So, sorry. <laughs> yes. Oh, wing. Wing. Yeah. Could you have done it all by yourself? I did, it. You I did it all by myself. And I, I, did, I set it all up by myself. And, and originally, we were going to run it for Australia and New Zealand. 
And we were told, and this is one of these sort of stupid things, Australian students can register in New Zealand and pay domestic fees. Has anybody heard that before? Yeah, it's not true. Except, exactly, they have to be resident. Well, even the ones that come over here for the practical course and are resident here, not resident, but resident for that period of time, aren't eligible either. But yes, they're right, they have to be resident. It doesn't apply to distance learning. So the first year we, we were breaking the law, we charged them all domestic fees. And we had a great intake. And, th and then Sydney got wise to it. And I think, too, the other thing we learned was they came to us. If we'd gone to them and said, we like what you're doing, can we be part of it? We'd have had a completely different deal. It was because it was our course. We gave it to them. They became partners with us, not the other way around, that we got it going. That's, that's my theory. I never had a chance to put it into practice, but that's my theory. Sorry, Sarah. Getting a bit over time. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Gordon. It's been a real privilege having you here. <laughs>